Hey class, welcome back. Mr. G here. Today we're going to be going over the parts of a kiln. So today's class, I have a, one of my sections of a test that I do in my ceramics class is we go over the components of a kiln. What are the things that actually make up the kiln? So let's go ahead and dive into all the different parts. So come, just, we'll just, yeah, together. All right, so number one, we're gonna start off with the lid. So start off with the top of the kiln, we have the lid. Notice how I have mine propped up. So I have a prop that holds the kiln up. And the reason we wanna do this one reason why we want to leave the lid propped up is because the lid is one of the most fragile components of the kiln reason being is because this thing is built completely out of kiln brick there's two types of bricks that are used in uh, kilns in general you have the traditional kiln brick and then you have a refractory brick the big difference that you can tell between the two a kiln brick is super duper light this thing is like air in my hand a refractory brick a refractory brick is kind of the same substance that is made of the of the post, the these things that hold up the kiln cells themselves. This thing is heavy, it's it's thick. Notice the different sound changes, how much thicker, denser this this time this type of material is than this. This stuff is aerated. So I want you guys to take a look at it. When they make these bricks, what they do is they take they take clay and then they put sawdust in it. And the sawdust then burns out and creates all these little air pockets inside the kiln brick. The cool thing about these bricks are they are super light and very easy to carve. So you can take a blade and you can carve different angles out of the, out of this brick uh, without having to, and you can do that post firing. This is kind of built to be used as a building block after it's been fired. Whereas with a refractory brick, you need to build it the way that it needs to be designed before it is fired. So this refract, this kiln brick, the, the kiln lining brick, and I know there's a name, and I'll probably have to put it in the video so you'll keep seeing it pop up. So the kiln brick itself, all these air, all these holes that are inside the brick hold the heat. So this is really good for insulation because as the kiln starts to heat up, the heat goes into this brick and it holds the heat so it can get up to those super high temperatures that a kiln can fire to. Remember, most kilns are pro rated to, to fire almost to 2,500 degrees. Um, so super, super duper hot. Uh, you can tell how what temperature your kiln fires at. There's a panel uh, on mine. So on mine, we have the kilt, the notes on the kiln right off to the side right here, and it tells you what the different how what the temperature it can fire to, what cone it can fire to. So this being an Olympic kiln, it can go to cone 10, and um, it, which is 2350, 2350 degrees, super duper hot. Super important to know what temperature your kiln fires to because that will dictate what kind of stuff you make sometimes because uh, if I couldn't fire all the way to cone 10 there's certain bits of uh, dinnerware that I wouldn't fire just because I want to ensure that my clay is fully uh, vitrified which is fully sealed up completely uh, during the firing process back to the lid real quick we have the hinge in the back to hold the kiln the lid to the kiln. These are separate items and the lid holder on the side. Uh, this is a very important piece of equipment because if it's not done properly, you'll lift it up and they'll slam back down because it doesn't, it's not being held by the, by the holder. Had a friend of mine, I was helping her set up her kiln. We had to make sure that that thing was bolted firmly into the two parts uh, because that kiln, that kiln lid was super duper heavy. Uh, some kilns also come with a uh, the lid holder is kind of a built-in hinge off of the top of the lid. Uh, you have to add some pins in the back together and it, and it holds the lid up. So instead of using uh, this and you have to raise and lower the kiln lid all by yourself, this kind of provides a little bit of a hoist. Uh, they do sell those. Just look into it if you're interested in one of those things. Now, continuing on the rest of the outside of the kiln itself. So the kiln itself is usually going to be hardwired directly into the wall. So I have mine directly wired into the wall, directly into the kiln itself. And I have the different sections of the heating elements that are that are powered from the boxes. On the, on the side down here, this and this box are basically the same unit together. This is the kiln setter. The kiln setter d tells the kiln how fast it should heat up and to what temperature. Now mine is, now I love mine because mine is completely digital. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, I have a video up in the top there. 
so just check out the playlist for on ceramics and you guys can see how we can do the kiln setter for a, a digital kiln setter or a manual kiln setter that's what's got dials on the side over here next thing we have we have the vent holes now the vent holes are for where heat can escape from the inside of the kiln out so it's for vent now for these vent holes we also have vent plugs plugs look just like this it's a little cone piece it has a little hole in the back I can just pop this directly in to the vent hole and what that's going to do is that's going to block how much heat is escaping from the kiln to ensure that my kiln can heat up fully to its to the right temperature if I have a higher fire higher temp firing I would definitely put the kiln plugs in because the air that's coming into the vent is not allowing the heat inside the kiln to fully reach the temperature so it sometimes struggles so I put the block on there just to make sure that it fires fine all on its own now there are three on the side of my kiln some kilns have more uh, you're gonna need a vent plug for each hole to ensure that you can plug them all properly if you don't have that you can make these yourself I actually had to make a set in college uh, I don't remember if my professor did that as an assignment or not or if he just didn't want to buy them because that does happen too what you're gonna do is you're gonna use you're gonna be using high fire clay you would want to use clay that is actually stronger higher temp than the clay that you would be firing to so if this is a cone 10 kiln uh, you can get uh, you're gonna need at least a cone 10 clay but I would also fuse a little bit of alumina hydrate alumina hydrate into the clay fold it in as you're building with it because that's gonna act as a uh, fire retardant which is alumina hydrate doesn't melt until it reaches over 3,000 degrees which will give a little bit of an extra insurance policy uh, that the piece will come out of the kiln without any issue and uh, and just provide a little more security for the pieces that you're working with all right so let's move on to the interior of the kiln now and down we go into the kiln now inside the kiln here we have a series of lines on the side of our kiln this is where we have our coils now the individual coils are inside of these little notches here you can see that i'm reaching back into it i do have the kiln off at this time to make sure that this is completely safe for me to touch there is no heat no electricity going to these elements so i can i can touch them without having to worry about electrocuting myself or burning myself two big issues with the kiln now each of these now each of these kiln bricks are as i said before these are very fragile pieces so you want to treat them delicately to make sure that they are properly that the coils inside of them are being held in there properly and that you don't nick or ding the sides to make sure that the kiln is uh as pristine as possible you want to keep make sure that there is no uh clay bits in there if there is i get a nice fine i have my handy little dustpan right here nice soft brush that i can use to sweep out any dust any part of particulates that'll be inside of the the kiln there uh, sometimes during the firing process you will have clay flex glaze flex or kiln wash flex that fall into there and you just want to sweep those things out periodically to make sure that your kiln stays healthy it's just a uh, preventive maintenance right there now as we're going down into the kiln we have our next series of things we have the kiln shelf and the kiln post now the posts are what we use to hold the shelves up now for me for this piece i have another video that talks about how to stack wear into your kiln this one i do on a four post measure i know it's hard to see this one back here but i put them on the outside of the edge to hold the piece together and when you are using kiln shelves always try and butt them up to each other so that the weight of, that they press against each other giving yourself a little more stability so again we have the kiln shelf the kiln post these are the elements that heat the kiln and the last thing inside of this if i can dip back over here it's got this little knob this is right on the other side of my kiln setter we're on the other side of the kiln setter right here so the kiln setter has a device inside of it that is called a thermocouple the thermocouple is directly behind this knob piece that is telling the it is a creating an electric current from the heat inside the kiln that's creating an electric current that goes directly into the kiln setter and tells us the temperature and tells us the temperature that is inside the kiln so right now everything is off i just turned everything on sitting at idle currently is sitting at 69 degrees 70 degrees inside the kiln and it's going to hold right there just because it, the kiln's not been on and uh keep the kiln room as cool as i possibly can as it is starting to heat up here in the springtime so the thermocouple 
creates um, creates that temperature is our temperature gauge. So the, it works the same as the thermostat in your house it is taking a measurement of the air temperature with inside the kiln. Now, if you want to go up one more level past that, they have what is called a perometer. The perometer is basically the same thing as the thermocouple. It is gauging the temperature inside of a kiln. Uh, it's gauging the fire, the temperature of fire. That's what the thermo the perometer means. And what we would use the perometer for is if we had a older kiln or a Raku kiln, I'm gonna move over here to one of my vent holes, we would stick the perometer into the vent hole to gauge how hot the fire is inside of the kiln during a Raku firing. And then we can pull the kiln, pull open the lid of the piece so the pieces can uh, be pulled out of the Raku kiln. Now, I will say one thing, you can take a older kiln regular electric kiln and turn it into a Raku kiln. But there is a couple things that I would kind of urge you to do. They make a special type of cement that you can put onto uh, the fire brick to give it a little more thermal protection. Because if this kiln is being heated up to about 2000 degrees and then you open the door and it's like 30 degrees outside because we usually did our Raku's during the winter time, you want to make sure that that thermal shock that happens to that kiln shelf, or that happens to that lid, does not crack or explode. So you wanna make sure that that is a safety thing. So make sure that you are wearing safety gear for that, uh, being as cautious as possible. Do it under somebody who's done it before, who has an idea of what's going on. A trained professional in ceramics uh, is just my opinion. So that kind of wraps up our stuff on the kiln, I think. And lastly, guys, make sure that at the bottom there, it's why I keep the little broom here handy for myself so I can take the top and sweep into the pan so I can properly dispose of any bits that are down in the bottom of my kiln so I can keep it nice and tidy at all times. Make sure that as you're doing that you do wear a mask because it does click up, kick up clay dust and you want to make sure that you're not breathing that dust in because that is harmful so make sure that you guys are being cautious as well. I think that's it for our kiln overview today. As always, let's go ahead and wrap up the class like we always do. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share on all those various platforms. Get the message out there to as many teachers as soon as possible. We want to educate the message. Everybody needs to know more about clay. Why? Because it's super awesome. Also, don't forget, if you guys had a question, comment, or concern, raise those hands down in the comments below. Have any answer questions for my classmates. Other than that, I will see you guys next class. Until then, I got some more stuff to fire, so I'll catch you guys later. See you guys.